Welcome everybody to this second day of the Nobel Symposium 2018 on nuclear disarmament, desirable, feasible, attainable. I think nuclear disarmament is feasible and desirable, but there are a lot of things that have to happen for nuclear disarmament to become a realistic option for many states in the future. I think the key reason that nuclear disarmament, first of all, is not feasible, attainable, and then of course desirable has to do with the fact that nuclear weapons provide tremendous security to those that possess them. It's not to say that nuclear weapons solve all problems or that there's no danger of nuclear war, but we need to keep the potential benefits of deterrence in mind before we decide to get rid of this tool of deterrence. I mean, I, I don't see any prospect uh, in the foreseeable future uh, to achieve global zero. Getting to zero would be nice but I'm much more concerned about nuclear risk reduction. Uh, what are the conditions that make the use of nuclear weapons more likely? And for that reason, I'm particularly concerned about the U.S.-Russian relationship. There's always been a, a tension between a view that the problem lies with the weapons themselves, uh, and that if only these could be reduced to almost nothingness, uh, then the world would be a safer place. And the belief that the problem is essentially a political, lie in real issues, and that uh, you're never actually going to get this disarmament unless you can deal with these political questions. And if you're not careful, uh, the effort to get disarmament may make them worse. I believe one of the, the most interesting and troubling uh, developments is the inability today uh, on the part of the United States and the Russian Federation to find very much in common uh, to talk about. They may both uh, uh, share uh, certain reservations about the so-called ban treaty or prohibition treaty. They find it impossible really uh, to meet and to discuss in a serious matter other pressing nuclear issues. The only thing that you can do, and this is something I have practiced in my work at the United Nations, is to get people together around the table in small groups and sometimes even chatting over a glass of wine or a glass of soda or whatever to basically approach your and harmonize your approaches and to see if you can get to a solution. It's really important to find out what are the other person's or other government's views and then to see how can you approach that, how can you bridge the the differences is that you have, and that's basically what the United Nations always does in a multilateral setting. Uh, my view is nobody ever knows who's right and who's wrong. Uh, we go through history blundering our way through and hoping that what we're doing is the right thing. I think we can see clearly when some uh, people, particularly when we have leaders who are not interested in what's right and wrong, and we're trying to grapple with uh, people who are prepared to go to war, people who are prepared to use weapons that are inhumane, that will kill countless ordinary people, or ordinary citizens. Um, and how to prevent that from happening is something that is uh, so important. The opportunities for different-minded people to engage each other in discussion seem to be getting more rare. On the other hand, when we do so, when we actually do have the opportunity to get together, my faith in our ability to engage in this kind of critical debate and critical thinking is, is bolstered. So ironically, I may be pessimistic about disarmament, but I'm optimistic about uh, the future of the analytical community to engage in, again, these crucially important debates. <laughs>